Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. To get the rewards that real estate can give you, you've got to take certain risks. It doesn't mean you have to be crazy and wild, but it means you've got to get in touch with your inner investor and decide how you can take smart risks as a real estate investor. That's what we'll talk about today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. If you've been listening to the Real Estate Guys for a while, then you've heard about the legendary Investor Summit. Simply put, it's the highest level event we do. And the content, faculty, and attendees are amazing. If you're serious about taking your real estate investment to the next level, consider joining us. You'll spend an entire week with like-minded investors, world-class educators, and real-world professionals. And you'll have a blast. It all begins April 1st, 2017 in Houston, Texas. Some alumni have already booked 60% of the cabins, but public registration is now open. Visit realestateguysradio.com and click on the tab that says Summit to learn more. We spend two days on land learning and networking, then jump aboard a luxury cruise ship for six more days of classes, roundtable discussions, great dinner conversations, and a ton of fun. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click Summit and make plans to spend a week with the Real Estate Guys and an all-star faculty on the 15th Annual Investor Summit at Sea. Welcome to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. With me as usual, co-host financial strategist, Russell Gray. Hey, Robert. And a gentleman we hadn't seen for a while, and he keeps showing up now uh, this year. Uh, let's say hi to the godfather of real estate, Mr. Bob Helms. Gentlemen, what a pleasure to be with you. Yes, indeed. You know, as a, a real estate investor, we're out looking for a return. We're out looking for opportunity. We're out looking for all the great things that real estate can offer, but we also have to take some risk. And risk can be interesting to folks. Some people are very, very, very risk adverse. Some people love to take educated risks. As a real estate investor, you have no choice. You have to risk something. You're risking your time. You're risking your capital. And we're going to talk about today how you can be very smart about that. Yeah, this is such a huge topic and so important because, you know, people look at returns and if it's just math, if it's just the numbers and you don't adjust for the, the potential for loss, uh, what we call risk adjusted returns, then you can end up thinking you're making a great investment, but actually making a very bad investment. There's a reason people with bad credit have 24% interest on their credit cards right and it's because the bank is taking a bigger risk and so they want a risk adjusted return they want a higher return so it's it's really common sense but a lot of times as real estate investors for whatever reason we just get fixated on the numbers we run the numbers and we really don't think about compared to what what else could i do with this money where else could it be and, and inside your portfolio when you would talk about portfolio strategy the idea is where does it fit in your portfolio you're going to have parts of your portfolio that are very low risk you're going to have parts of your portfolio that are maybe a little bit more stable, medium risk, and then you're going to have things that are a little bit more speculative. And if you aren't doing portfolio management, something very common in the paper asset world, very uncommon in the real estate world. Real estate people are all just doing the deal, doing the deal. And your, your thrill of the deal, the personality type that really loves to do the deal, that adds a degree of risk because even your own emotional engagement presents a degree of risk. So these are all things you have to be thinking about as you're considering what you're doing with money. And it's even more important that you understand these things when you take on the responsibility of managing other people's money. You take risks every single day. The minute you walk out of your house, you take a risk. And not walking out of your house, you're taking a risk. We drive in cars all the time. And yet every single day in the world, people are killed in car accidents. But the likelihood isn't so high that we're not willing to go. If half the time you got in a car, you got in an accident and died, well, you probably wouldn't get in a car very much because it's so rare. I'm in airplanes a whole lot. I fly in a lot of airplanes, but you know what? Every now and then an airplane goes down, but the odds of it happening are so small. So the risk adjusted part is you can't just focus on the risk. If you do that, you'll never do anything. But at the same time, you can't just focus on the reward of the return and not take into consideration the risk. Well, let's go with the car analogy. I think it's a good one. You know, if you get into a car that's well maintained and it's driven by somebody who's an experienced driver and you're riding on good condition roads and good weather, then that is a level of risk. If you get into an old jalopy that's driven by a drunk and you're on an icy road with a blinding storm, that's a different level of risk. How so? And so, oh, no. <laughs> and so if, if your goal is to get from point A to point B and you're fixated and the guy says, Hey, I can get you to point A to point B in 20 minutes because I'm going to drive 120. <laughs> and the other guy says, it's going to take me 40 minutes because I'm going to drive 60. And you say, well, I need to get there in 20 minutes. I'll do 120. 
Well, it's probably there needs to be an emergency. There needs to be something where you're willing to take a high level of risk because the danger of not getting there on time is high. Otherwise, you would never take that risk. Again, it's, it seems like common sense. When somebody says you're like, duh, but you'd be shocked how many people do not think this way when they're in the middle of a deal and they end up taking inordinate risks. I mean, I signed personal guarantees on loans and I did not ask for any compensation whatsoever and, and that was ridiculous. That was stupid. That yeah. was irresponsible. It was high risk with absolutely no promise of return. You know, we could have used that a couple of weeks ago when we did stupid investor tricks. Yeah, tricks. exactly. So that why, was one. Yeah. why did I do that? I did that because I was caught up in the deal. I was caught up in the emotion, uh, the excitement. I wanted to be very supportive to the investors, but it was stupid. And it was stupid because I, my emotions got the best of me. And they weren't negative emotions. They were positive emotions. So it's not even like I was afraid. The problem is I wasn't afraid enough. I needed to think about it and I didn't do it. And it wasn't about whether you wanted to do it or not. The real issue wasn't whether it was a good idea. It's had you done your homework, were you educated enough about what those risks actually were and under what conditions they could be serious and you'd need to pay attention. Yeah, today, you know, when we approach a project or a piece of property, any acquisition, or we have a base of knowledge and experience that we could make some decisions that earlier in our careers might uh, not be as obvious. As you're starting out, you don't know what all the risks are. So you get counsel, you get a great agent or broker, you get someone who's going to look over your shoulder and just make sure. And so the first part you have to do is get in touch with yourself. When we talk about personal investment philosophy, one of the things we talk about is how conservative or aggressive are you as a person? And that really comes down to your perception of risk. Am I a conservative? We just met with a guy who kept using the word, I'm pretty conservative, but I'm fairly conservative. I'm kind of conservative. I mean, I must have said that four or five times in a 40-minute conversation. And I'm thinking, this guy's pretty conservative, right? I, I don't talk much. I look for little base hits, right? I mean, he just, great, nothing wrong with that. Then you get the deal junkies who are like, hey, I got over this deal and then that deal and I leveraged that and then this deal. And you're like, wow, I'm getting nervous just listening to you talk. It's not a right or wrong. It's not that you should or shouldn't take risk. It's about you understanding when you're out of your risk zone, when you're taking too much risk or not enough risk. Well, I mean, you know, somebody may say, well, okay, we're, we're in an inflationary environment. I've taken a very conservative position. I've bought bonds at low yields. I put my money in savings accounts and CDs at low yields and uh, I'm risk averse. But in reality, you're taking a lot of risk of loss of purchasing power. In the case of the bonds, actually loss of principal. And the same thing could be true. I mean, you could just use mortgages. You could be buying mortgages or notes in real estate. So the concept is exactly the same. And it goes back to this notion of, of just understanding. You know, in my case, Bob, I, I didn't even take time to assess the risk. I knew the risks. That wasn't my problem. My problem was I just didn't think it through. There's just understanding what would I be willing to do? What, what would be fair to me, to my family? Uh, you know, what, what would be reasonable? And this is the thing you have to think about is like, okay, what else could I do with this money? And if I'm going to take, and what are the risks of those activities versus this activity? And if I choose to structure the deal this way, I have a potential for a lot more gain, but I have a lot more leverage. My cash flow is a lot thinner. If I hit my marks and everything goes perfect, I'm going to get a big fat return. If I pad the thing a little bit, if I use a little less leverage, if I hold a little bit more back in terms of my reserves, now I don't get quite as big a return, but if something goes sideways, I'm prepared. Again, there's a lot of range in between, you know, no debt and lots of debt and lots of reserves and few reserves and lots of room in cash flow and thin cash flow. Neither is right or wrong, but you just have to understand if you're going to take more risk into the portfolio or into the transaction, you're going to want to offset that with the potential for higher gain. And these are probability decisions, business decisions, judgments that you have to make. And so the first thing to be aware of is that you have to make them. The second thing is you have to know how to make them, which is a matter of assessing each and every situation and talking about what happens if everything goes as planned, but also what happens if something goes wrong. And then what would that cost you and what would you be willing to risk in order to do that? And it doesn't happen in a vacuum. I can remember when you used to do the consultations with investors, you'd look at their portfolio. And if I have just one house, that's my investment. I have one house then it's either 100% occupied or 100% vacant. So my risk of vacancy doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's either all vacant or not vacant. I got to look at the market. Once I have 10 properties, 
the chance of them all being vacant at the same time is not very high at all. So we make different decisions based on what our portfolio looks like. A triple net lease where somebody else, your tenant, is responsible for everything, the cost of maintenance, the taxes, the insurance, is very different than a property where you're completely responsible, like most residential properties. So your risk has to do with the property and the risk you perceive. Let's take an example of risk, which is insurance. What is insurance? Insurance is division of risk. If there's 100 people in each of a house, 100 houses, and the insurance actuarials know that one's going to burn down, in the next five years, one of these 100 houses is going to have a fire and burn down. We don't know which one, so we're going to collect some money from each of the 100 owners, put it in a pile, and then when that house burns down, whosoever it is, they're going to get the money. No one wants that to be them. Insurance isn't a product you want to use, but I'm happy to put money away, so if it's me, I'm covered. There are companies that are so big, they get to their portfolios being so large, they do what's called self-insurance. They don't actually pay a premium to insure because they can sustain the risk. They can handle the risk themselves. Some big hotel companies are self-insured. They don't pay an insurance company a premium. Instead, they put away money from their large operations. We know a couple of real estate investors like that, a hundred houses. If you just put away a little money from 100 rental houses every month, you're going to have the money. If something goes wrong, you might decide the risk. When you start out, you'd rather not have the risk on your shoulders, perhaps. But I think it starts with understanding yourself. Well, there's an interesting point about what does conservative mean. It doesn't mean the same thing to all of us. The ultimate conservative approach is if I don't do anything, then I'll never do anything wrong. I'll also never go anywhere. So you've got to weigh what the practical approach and what the practical consequences are of the thing you're examining the risk. Peter Drucker says there is the risk that you cannot afford to take and there is the risk that you cannot afford not to take. We have to take some risks. If we're ever going to get married, we have to take the risk of being rejected asking for a date, right? We just have to do that. And you know what? You're probably going to get rejected. We don't like rejection. So we put ourselves in a position where we don't have to get rejected as often. That's because we know ourselves. Think of the real estate guys, right? We would just rather have you come and come to our events and it would all be great. We don't have to ask you. We don't call, Russ and I don't call you up on the phone and say, hey, would you come to Secrets of Successful Syndication in March? And you go, well, you know, I'm not really interested. Ah, oh, I'm rejected. We just tell you about it and the right people show up. So you can manage your life based on your interior risk assessment, where you are. And the conservative versus aggressive, you're right. That's not a fixed amount. That's a, that's a personal thing. I look at some investments that I think are pretty conservative, and those people feel they're pretty aggressive. So you have to decide for yourself. Well, I want to go back to this concept of portfolio risk because the inside your portfolio, if you're looking at your financials, you're going to have certain things that are going to be very, very conservative because the cost of loss is greater than the desire for gain. If, if you lose your personal residence, that's a lot worse for you than it is if you lose a rental property. Which is a lot worse than if you lose the hundredth rental property. Right, exactly. So the idea is that you have this portion of your portfolio that's conservatively structured. You have cash on your balance sheet. Yes, it doesn't earn very much, but that liquidity provides me a degree of security. And I have a minimum level of amount of liquidity that I want to maintain at all times. I may use some leverage in a personal residence. Maybe I would use a lot, but I might move the the value and to have the ability to pay it off. Instead of paying it off, I would go ahead and use the leverage, but I would put the money someplace very, very conservative that I would be able to immediately pay the loan off if I wanted to or if I needed to. It gives me a degree of security. I never would want to be in a situation where uh, a stream of income that I was using to support the mortgage payment went away and now all of a sudden I don't have a home. So I might be willing to take greater risks on that foundation. Once I know I've got that base laid, it's like, okay, I'm very, very conservative there, but I'll slice off a little piece of that I take a little bit of money on a home equity loan or maybe take a little bit of money out of my retirement account, a little money out of my, my cash savings, and I'm going to use that to make my first investment. If I lose that money on that first investment, then I'm either going to have to go back into my inner circle risk of risk, my safe place, and, and put more at risk. And now I start to begin to leach out that firewall between the first ring. You've got the in, inside that first ring, you've got the things that are very, very conservative. You put a little bit out there, but then you seal the door off both mentally 
and structurally. Well, think of this in what we call rings of risk, which that's what we, the rings you're referring to are these rings of risk. And the closer in the center of the target is the more conservative stuff you got to be careful with. As the rings go out further, you can take more and more risk. There's a part of your portfolio, you know, I get a stock tip, this thing's going to 10x. Okay, I'm not going to throw everything into that. Or I, you know, I read a newsletter and it says gold's going up tomorrow. Okay, that might, maybe I'll take a little bit of risk, but I'm not going to risk my children's educational fund and my home on a stock tip. But who knows? Maybe if I trust the person, if I've had good experience before, all these newsletter prognosticators are out there, right? You pay money for their opinion. Better take it sometimes, I guess. But the way you perceive risk can be different in different parts of your portfolio. Absolutely. And that's the point. And early in my life, sadly, I didn't recognize those things. So I would lever up to play the stock market. And that was stupid. And I would I would invest money that I absolutely could not afford to lose in things that were high risk, high reward. But because I felt lucky, I felt competent. I felt like I could master, you know, the market. Uh, the stock market humbled me real quick. And so I realized that, you know, this whole concept that I've come up with about, you know, rings of risk and portfolio structure really grew out of those experiences and the mistakes I made. And so when you begin to understand that, you know, it's not just a matter of saying, oh, well, this is how I am. And this is my personal investment philosophy. Therefore, all investments I do are going to fit in this box. Right. And it's not that way at all. What I'm saying is, is you're looking at your portfolio and you're saying, okay, investments that I do inside this circle are going to fit a certain profile. And the circle might be bigger or less depending on what your personal conservative or aggressive nature correct, is. Correct. Correct. Some people would say, I would not feel comfortable having any mortgage whatsoever on my personal residence ever. I don't want that. I wouldn't do that. I, I would never feel comfortable having less than a year of living expenses in cash on hand at all times, no matter what. Right. Uh, some people would feel that way. Other people say, hey, I'm very comfortable having a small mortgage because I know that I can always find a way to make that payment. Uh, I don't have to have a year. I would be happy with three months because uh, I know I could always start a business or get another job. I feel very confident in that. That's okay. That That's to your point, Robert. That's what you need to make. Those decisions are going on inside that first ring. In the second ring, that's your, your first set of investing outside of things that you depend on to you know, live and, and earn income and support your family. And so you go outside there and you say, okay, I'm going to take a little bit more risk there. I'm going to use a little bit more leverage because the consequences of losing uh, there aren't devastating, but they're not good because now I'm going to have to wait till I can save up enough money out of my inner circle to be able to come back and go to that first ring. So I'm going to be pretty conservative on that. But once I kind of got that going, I got some passive income coming in. I got some strength on my balance sheet. I got some diversification. Now I can begin to go, okay, I'm going to take some of this money that's coming off of these positive cash flow properties and I'm going to start levering that up or I'm going to start doing things a little bit more risky. I might I might start doing some options or something. And I'm talking stock trading. I'm talking, you know, in real estate. I mean, this, but however you choose to do it and you say, okay, if I were to lose a hundred percent of that, it's not really going to matter because the, the, that second ring is just going to spit out a little bit more and it's never going to touch my personal life. You know, and so that's kind of that concept. So as you're thinking about listening to this episode and what action items you can take coming out of it is to sit down and just draw like three circles and you've got your inner circle, which is your very conservative, the things you need to survive and provide for your family. Second tier, which is things that, you know, you need to be able to count on and begin to grow conservatively. You're not going to hit many home runs. You might get lucky. Sometimes you do. And then the things where you say, okay, now that I've got that, where, where could I go out and, and, and be a little bit more aggressive? And if you want to compress time frame, of course, we always say, go find people who've already built rings one and two and they have money in ring three that they're looking for somebody to invest. And if you know how to make money in ring three, but you just don't have your own money to go do, then, then go help other people do that. We're talking about accepting risks on the way to rewards in real estate. We've got more ideas for you when we come back. You're tuned to the Real Estate Guys radio program. I'm your host, Robert Helms. Real estate investment advice right in your mailbox. Sign up for the free Real Estate Guys newsletter at realestateguysradio.com. Forbes rated Memphis the best cash flow market in the nation. And our good friend Terry Kerr at Mid South Home Buyers has been the premier turnkey rental property provider in Memphis for over 13 years. With an A plus rating for the Better Business Bureau, Terry has renovated over 750 houses. Real Estate Guys listeners have snapped up hundreds. Discover what these satisfied investors already know. Mid-South's properties are completely renovated with a one-year warranty and a lifelong rental guarantee. They're affordable, well-managed, and easy to own. Perfect for beginning investors and veterans alike. Get in on the action. Contact Terry and his team via email at midsouth at realestateguysradio.com. Hi. 
This is Patrick Donahoe of Paradigm Life. Wall Street and banks spend billions of dollars per year in advertising with the goal to convince you that they are the solution. But take a look around. None of their advice has worked. The number one concern of all Americans is still money. So are you ready for another way? I've spent the last 10 years teaching people like you a superior way to build wealth and financial independence outside of Wall Street. I've developed a free e-learning program called Infinite 101, where you can learn about the perpetual wealth strategy. In this free program, you'll learn how to build your wealth without a 401k, IRA, or mutual funds. You'll also learn how to establish private financing without ever having to walk into a bank again. These are just two of the many ways this free program can propel you toward financial independence. Simply go to paradigmlife.net and click on the register button on the top right corner of the page to gain instant access. Hello, I'm Herman Cain, and you are listening to the Dynamic Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to the Real Estate Guys radio program. Heard every weekend on this great radio station all the time at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for tuning into the show today. This is an important topic, and one we don't always think about. I mean, we think about risk. We look at a deal, and we go, eh, it could be a little risky. But this is beyond that. This is deciding how to take smart risks, risks that you're going to have to take, but you don't want to take more risk than you feel comfortable with. You know, you want to be able to sleep at night. If, if I feel confident in my ability to earn income, I might have a big house and a big mortgage. And I'm like, no problem. I can sleep at night. But if my spouse can't, that's a problem, right? So we love leverage. Leverage is a great tool. You can get excellent rates on your primary residence. But there are definitely folks for whom no loan on your primary residence makes a lot of sense because no matter what happens, we're good. That's the inner investor part. Then there's the part of calculation. Russ always says, do the math and the math tell you what to do. You can't always pinpoint risk. That's the interesting thing about it. There's what I call real risk and perceived risk. And most of the risk people deal with is perceived risk. Their perception of risk is different. I remember we had this fun debate in our mentoring club years ago where we said, which is riskier, buying an existing building or building something from the ground up? And there was a group of folks said, well, it's absolutely more risky to build something from the ground up. I mean, a thousand things could go wrong and you've got so many moving parts. If I buy an existing building, I get it inspected and I'm good. I'm off to the races. I got income. And then the other group would go, no, 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 no. When you buy an existing building, you have no idea what was done, what's behind the walls, who built it, was it the low cost bidder? You've, you've got all kinds of things hiding and waiting that could be ugly and awful when you build from the ground up. You could decide exactly what materials to use, who to use, right? So those are differences of opinion. It's not right or wrong. It's you figuring out what do you perceive the risk to be? When I ask a group of investors in a room, how many of you think it's in, it's risky to invest outside of your home country? There's hands that go up. Yeah, it's risky to invest outside of, say, the U.S. I, I live in the U.S. I invest in the U.S. Investing anywhere else is risky. Then you follow it up with this question. Who thinks it's risky to have all of their investment capital tied to one nation's economy and currency? Well, then a whole bunch of other hands come up, sometimes even the same hands, like that's risky. So it's not avoiding risk. You can avoid risk in certain ways. That's not it. It's being smart about risk. Well, part of being smart about it is investing in things that you understand and have a degree of control over. In your prior example, it was like, okay, if you know how to build a property, you have the knowledge, you know how to do it, and you have a lot more control over what it is because you get to make the choices along the way in the entire process versus buying something that somebody else built because you don't know how to build it, but if at least if you know how to inspect it. If you don't even know how to inspect it, if you don't even know how to do the due diligence on the income or the structure uh, or the, the title history and all the things that you have to do, if you don't know how to do that, then it's, it's a bad investment for you or it might be a perfectly great investment for someone else. And, you know, we had this opportunity. We found what we thought was the greatest real estate deal. In fact, so far it has been the greatest real estate deal that we've ever seen. And we said, hey, let's take this to a, a friend of ours, very wealthy friend of ours. And we sat down with him. We said, hey, you know, he's a multi, he's a guy that invests in multifamily, loves multifamily, done very well in multifamily. And we said, hey, we'd like you to take a look at this. It's a little outside your wheelhouse, but uh, we think it's a great opportunity. What do you think? And he goes, you know, it looks great, but I don't know anything about it. 
I don't understand it. And so it's probably great for you guys because it's clear you guys know all about it. But for me, not so much. Yeah. And that was a guy that just understood what risk he was willing to take and what risk he wasn't willing to take. And so I agree with your, your point. You know, it is perception. And part of perception is not just the perception or the reaction that you have to a specific property, but it is largely being self-aware. And right now we're just talking self-aware of what you're good at and what you're not good at, what you're willing to do, what you're not willing to do. It could be in terms of this would be a good deal if I had the time to really focus on it. If I really, but in, You may be in a season in life where I, I'd love to do this deal, but I don't have the time. So I can either do it sloppy or I can pass. Well, that's a great example because that particular risk isn't the risk of the deal changing. It's the risk of you being able to pay attention to it. This happens in my world. We're busy these days and we got a lot going on and a couple of really big projects and someone brings what would have been an amazing deal four or five years ago, not, not in terms of the market cycle, but in terms of where we were in our appetite for new stuff. And I, I can't even look at it. I'm, I'm like, well, gosh, I'm sure that would be great, but I, it's too risky for me to take my eye off the ball I'm working on to go do that. Whereas if I was just sitting around twiddling my thumbs, so risk isn't just about inherent risk in the property, it's about you. Yeah, there was a time, Robert, and you know, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but there was a time where you said yes a whole lot more than you said no. <laughs> yes, Today, you, you say no a whole lot more than you say yes. That's true. And, and that's because you're focused. And because I think you're focused, that particular investment is going very, very well. And it's been a good decision. So for you, it would have been risky to say yes to the good because it would have cost you the great. And, you know, you matured as an investor and I've been with you and watched it happen and it, it makes you a better, safer investor. And yet the returns are great because you're pouring your energy into something very specific that you're focused on. It would be risky for you to take your eye off the ball. And so there is a personal involvement factor. It goes back to understanding, you know, what you're willing to do, what you're capable of doing in terms of your knowledge. It also factors into your team, who's around you, who else is helping you. That deal that I'm talking about, Robert, there's a particular person involved, if that person wasn't involved, that deal wouldn't be going so well. Right. I mean, so, but because that person is there, it was a deal worth going after. So it wasn't as risky for us because we knew we had the right people on the bus. And so there's a lot of factors that go in that are far from mathematical, far from philosophical, but are very much uh, inside of your mind and emotions. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. And then also who you have around you and, and what you're capable of doing. It's important to recognize that the timing isn't just controlled by the market. It's where you are. And that the example you've just given is perfect because you're not in the same place in a certain part of your life that you may have been. The property may have the exact same opportunity it had, but you may not be able to devote the time or energy you may be otherwise committed. So the timing isn't just market timing, it's where are you in that market? Don't forget about risk, just learn to take smart risks. That's what we're talking about today. When we come back, we're gonna play Real Estate Trivia, give you a chance to win a prize with very little risk on The Real Estate Guys radio program. Live nationwide, you're listening to The Real Estate Guys. Find out more at realestateguysradio.com. If you love real estate and have always wanted to own your own business, listen up. The Real Estate Guys and their panel of experts want to teach you how to go full-time fast in the real estate syndication business. These next few years may go down in history as one of the best times ever to acquire investment real estate. There are deals everywhere if you know where to look and how to assemble the resources. The Secrets of Successful Syndication Seminar will show you how to make big money doing big deals from a team of experts that have syndicated projects totaling more than $1 billion. Don't wait for someone to give you a raise or create a job for you. Attend the secrets of successful syndication and learn how to build a team, raise capital, find deals, and make full-time money in six months or less. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. All the big players use syndication as a way to diversify risk, optimize profits, and earn big money. You can too. Go to realestateguysradio.com and click on events. Hi, this is Garrett Sutton, Robert Kiyosaki's asset protection attorney and the author of Loopholes of Real Estate and Start Your Own Corporation. As an American or foreign-based investor in U.S. real estate, you know we are a litigious society. 
You know that you need to protect your real estate, paper, and bullion holdings with the right mix of LLCs and corporations. Our firm, Corporate Direct, not only forms these entities, but importantly, we properly maintain them too. If you fail to follow the corporate formalities, you can lose it all in an instant. Corporate Direct is your source for LLC protection and maintenance in all 50 states. Visit CorporateDirect.com or call 800-600-1760. Mention the Real Estate Guys for a free bonus. That's 800-600-1760 or CorporateDirect.com. We look forward to assisting you at CorporateDirect.com. Hi, I'm Mark Victor Hans. You're listening to The Real Estate Guys. If you want to expand your consciousness, expand your wealth, expand your future, and have more delight and excite in your future than in your past, keep listening to The Real Estate Guys. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. Thanks for tuning into the show. We're talking today about smart risk taking. You've got to take risks, but don't just take any risk. Make sure you're thinking about it and you've done the homework and you're taking smart risks. And before we're done, we're going to talk about how do you mitigate risk? Once you've taken a risk, how do you take some of the sting off and have a better likelihood of success? Before we get back to that discussion, it's time to play Real Estate Trivia. This is your chance to win a prize. By knowing today's Real Estate Trivia question, in just a minute, I'm going to ask you a question that has something to do with real estate and you are going to give us the answer. How you do that? Well, you send an email to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. You'll need to include your name the answer to the question, and your physical mailing address, because if you win, we're sending you a copy of Robert Kiyosaki's book, Second Chance. It's a big book, and you're going to love it. We'll send it to you if you know today's real estate trivia question, and you're the first to get us the answer. Last week on the show, we were talking about finding your tribe, and we asked you this, which country has the most time zones? Well, it's it may be surprising. It was to me, if you include all the dependent territories, France has the most time zones, with 12, tied for second place with 11 are Russia and the United States. Here's our real estate trivia question for this week. Which U.S. location, which big chunk of real estate, receives the most annual snowfall? Where's the most annual snowfall in the U.S.? It's currently winter in the U.S. and there's a lot of snow around and uh, maybe you're in a part of the world where it's summer and it's sunny, but in the U.S. there is a list of places that have a lot of snow. Which one's number one when it comes to snow? If you think you want to take a guess, send us your best guess to trivia at realestateguysradio.com. Include your name and your mailing address so that if you're the winner, we can send you Robert Kiyosaki's great book, Second Chance. That's today's real estate trivia question. We're talking about assuming risk on our way to reward, how we can find properties and opportunities and just weigh what the downside could be and what the upside could be and then decide to make an educated risk assessment. So one of the other things to think about is your emotional makeup. You know, when you talk about investing, the two investor emotions are greed and fear. Yeah. You know, if you were to look at a spectrum and on the far end of the spectrum was fear and on the opposite end of the spectrum was greed, uh, somewhere in between there is rationality. Blair Singer says all the time, when emotions run high, intelligence runs low. And so you may be more uh, leaning towards being a fearful person, a little bit more apprehensive, a little bit more uh, concerned about the unknown, fearful of the unknown. And so you're risk averse only because you don't handle uncertainty well. And so it isn't that the deal is risky, it's that you have a risky perception of anything unknown. Investments for you that you're going to be comfortable with are going to have to do more with having control, predictable outcomes. Not that anything is completely predictable, but you would probably cater more towards those. If you go too far down the fear path, you end up not doing any deals at all, which is in itself a risk. You cannot make any money on a property you do not own. Yes, you can't lose money on a property you don't own, but if the goal is to make money, you have no chance if you don't do the deal. So fear costs you. On the other side of it, you've got greed. Greed. Greed gets you chasing markets, chasing deals, overbidding. You lose your composure. You fall in love with the property or the thrill of the deal, or it becomes a personal badge of honor that I'm going to get this deal done no matter what. I'm going to be the winner. This property is my property. I own it. You know, it needs to be mine or whatever. And the problem is, is and that outer 
range of that spectrum, you start to lose rationality. And so again, it's a perception. So the goal as an investor is to stay inside. So we talked about rings of risk. Now you have emotional rings of risk. There's going to be places where you, you do need to have a high level of security because it makes you emotionally stressed. You know, you talked about Robert, well, I'm fine having a mortgage on my house, but my wife isn't, right? And I mean, I'm not talking about your personal situation, but I'm just saying there are people out there like that. Well, you have to make a decision based on your collective anxiety, your emotional makeup, you know, where are you going to put that? So your your emotional reaction to if something went wrong, not the financial consequences of what goes wrong, the emotional reaction to what goes wrong or what could go wrong or right in any one of those given rings of risk is going to impact how you behave. And if you understand how you behave is going to affect the results you produce, then making sure that you can keep tight control on your emotions so that you're always operating within a range of intelligence where you're going to make good, pragmatic, well-informed business decisions. And if you find yourself trying to do investments that are perfectly good for somebody else who stays more composed and you're in an area and you're making bad decisions, then that's risky to you and you need to be aware of it. You need to be self-aware. You bet. We talk about this when we discuss product type. For example, if you're attracted to the return potential for C-class property, but don't have the stomach and fortitude for that profile, that's not a good combination. Sure, I can get better returns in C-class properties if I know what I'm doing. If I don't, I can lose everything. So every investor is different, every property is different. It gets even more complicated when you raise money. When you bring in a partner or syndicate a deal and raise money for it, and you've got to make a decision as the manager to take a risk, you're going to look at all the possibilities. You're going to come up with, hopefully, a really great opportunity. But you've got to be able to articulate to your potential prospects what kind of risks are really involved. Your deal for one person might be great, but for somebody else, it's too much. Sometimes we say, that's the most expensive check I ever took. As a syndicator, you're looking for an investor to come alongside you who's confident in your ability to find a deal at a market as well as your ability to manage it. But if they cannot stomach the risk, then despite how much they like you on the deal, it's not going to be a good match. So a deal has to be a fit for you when it comes to risk. And if you're bringing in a partner, your spouse, other investors, it has to be a fit for them too. Any mismatch when you bring in other people is going to be magnified. We're talking about risk and risk-adjusted returns in real estate. When we come back, we're going to talk about what can you do to mitigate risk in your investments. Today on the Real Estate Guys radio program. Need help with your real estate investment portfolio? Check out the resources page at realestateguysradio.com. Are you ready to profit in paradise? Hi, it's Robert Helms. And if you think real estate investing means tenants, toilets, and termites, think again. Located just a short plane ride from the U.S., a virtually untouched paradise awaits. The beautiful country of Belize. When you go to Belize with the Real Estate Guys, you'll spend four fabulous days discovering one of the most intriguing real estate markets I've ever seen. With its jungle rainforests, pristine beaches, and 81-degree turquoise water, Belize is one of the most beautiful places on Earth. Plus, it's considered one of the top seven tax havens in the world. Belize property is on the rise and many experts think the best is yet to come but don't just take my word for it come experience belize firsthand at our upcoming investor field trip when you join us you'll discover the many reasons we love belize like tremendously undervalued beachfront land super low taxes ease of doing business and so much more get the details at realestateguysradio.com just click on events see paradise for yourself click events at realestateguysradio.com and i'll see you in beautiful belize Hey, it's Ken McElroy. I listen to The Real Estate Guys, and so should you. Welcome back to The Real Estate Guys radio program. We're so happy you're here. We'd be even happier if you were going to join us on the Investor Summit at Sea. It's our 15th year, and we're so excited about this event. It happens in April, and we start in Houston, Texas. We go visit beautiful parts of the world with the most amazing group of people, our faculty, our summiteers. Get all the details on our website at realestateguysradio.com under Summit. We're talking about risk, smart risk taking for real estate investors. And uh, we've talked a lot about the types of risk and the nature of risk. And some of that's pretty obvious. But I think let's spend a section talking about how we mitigate risk. Because there are just risks. And that's just how it is. Stuff is going to happen. Uh, lightning is going to strike. Tornadoes are going to happen. Tenants are going to move out. How do I mitigate risk? Well, an obvious way is through insurance. 
We buy insurance on properties to mitigate risk. We've talked a little bit about that. Another way we mitigate risk is we hire the right people. I don't hire the cheapest property manager. I hire the best property manager. Yeah, we talk about this a lot, the, the concept of the three Cs. You have to trust people in, in multiple ways. And right. You have to trust their character, that they're not going to steal from you, you know, ethics. You have to trust their commitment, that they are available and willing to work with you and do whatever it is you've hired them to do. And they have to have competence. They have to know what they're doing. And so if you hire people that don't know what they're doing, then you're going to have a problem. I mean, it seems obvious, but it is amazing how many times people just miss some of that stuff. Uh, and that's part of being educated. That's another area of, of risk mitigation is just simply being educated. We alluded to, to it earlier with the one fellow who said, no, I, it might be a great investment for you, but not for me because I don't understand it. I'm not educated. This is not something to gloss over. This is one of the biggest tools to mitigate risk, education. Of course, it's risky to invest in another country if I don't understand their basis of law and how real estate is transacted and what tenant landlord law looks like and what uh, mortgages and, and chattels and encumbrances and notaries and all that. Yeah, that's risky. So if I get educated and I learn that stuff, I find that some of those markets are way less risky. We're in a couple foreign markets that are, to my perception, a lot less risky than U.S. markets because... They don't have the same liability laws. They don't have the same assumption of burden of proof. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to like international investing after you've learned about it. At first, of course not. If people say, yeah, what do you know about the soybean market in Ecuador? I, I don't know anything about that market. Do they even grow soybeans in Ecuador? If someone brings me a deal about that, I don't know nothing about it. So I'm probably going to say, well, Either I need to get educated because it seems really great or I'm going to pass. Yeah, you need to be educated. You need to be well advised. We talked about you need to be self-aware. Uh, you need to have a strategy uh, and the discipline to uh, execute the strategy with the help of your advisors. And then the other thing is, you you know, you pick your partners very carefully. Now, you know, you may have some givens, you know, you married who you married and they feel how they feel. And if you're going to make investments, uh, you're going to have to cut a deal that is, is mutually agreeable. Uh, if you decide to take on third party investors and you haven't done that yet, listening to a show like this, will help you maybe think things through a little bit more because you can't have somebody hitting the panic button every time something goes sideways. You know, getting the wrong person on the bus, you're trying to make strategic decisions. You're trying to move. You're trying to take advantage of opportunity or handle a problem. And then you've got somebody on the bus who, you know, has the right to have an opinion because they're in the deal and they are arguing with you and they're in the way and they're creating all kinds of drama and chaos. And that that's their right to do that. They have to contend for what they believe in. But because you didn't do the homework in the beginning, you added risk to a deal when it didn't need to be there. Right. See, that happened a lot. You know, a couple weeks ago at the uh, Goals event, I distinctly remember two different couples I talked to. And in one case, he was the listener. And about a couple of years ago, he started listening to the show. He brought along his wife and now she's really come on board. And she says, I'm the driver now. I mean, he still loves your show and he still likes real estate, but I'm, I'm way into it. And he's looking at her going, yeah. Then I made another couple and he's like, I am so glad I'm here with my wife. She could care less about real estate. I mean, she knows she doesn't want anything to do with her real estate investing, but this has made such a difference for her and for us to be here together. Well, there's two marriages that are investor families and one, the, the spouses couldn't care a lot. They're totally different and one, they're unified. It's not right or wrong, right? It's just who you are. So to your point, the people in your life are also going to dictate this. When I was single, I took a lot more risks than now than I do now that I have a family. Sure. Well, you know, the other thing too is, is there's not much you can do to blow up your finances that's worse than getting a divorce <laughs> that's, that's true. <laughs> or getting involved in an investor lawsuit. I mean, a business divorce or a uh, marriage divorce is just devastating. And so that's a degree of risk. Uh, so it's just, again, the idea is not to freak people out. It's to be sober. It's to be informed. It's to think it through and understand it's not just math. I mean, I'm the guy that says do the math and the math will tell you what to do. But it really is so much bigger than that. Return on investment is so much bigger than just math. It's, it's all of these different components. And and putting together a recipe, a cocktail, if you will, where all the ingredients jag together and actually is something, you know, that tastes good, uh, if I can use that metaphor. One of the interesting thoughts here is that you need to be careful about putting on your rose-colored glasses because you're so excited. You're so sure this is going to work. You need to have a balance there in terms of whether I really want this to work and therefore I'm going to lean 
towards making it work. Yeah, you definitely have that bias. And I see that happen in real estate all the time. Someone gets so attached to the outcome. It's sobering. You need some sobering moments. You need a deal killer, uh, otherwise known as an attorney, to come along and say, hey, wait a minute, take a look at this. We need red corpuscles and we need white corpuscles, right? We need to build and we need to protect. So risk is one of those things. And then layered on top of that today is market risk economic risk, political risk. I mean, there's all kinds of things. I'm not talking about zombie apocalypse, the thing that's going to ruin everybody, the black swan event. Really no way to mitigate against something like that happening. But certainly through diversifying in our product types, in our markets, in every area we can think of, depending on where we feel the risk is in the economy. We've got the U.S. I don't know if you've heard we're We've got a new president coming aboard and, and that may change things, right? There's risks that are mostly outside of your control. And then some of the things we've talked about on this show today are risks that are really inside your control. Yeah. And you can't worry about things that are outside your control. You need to be aware of them. So it's, again, being objective and then dealing with the realities for what they are and looking at your available options. Sometimes, you know, you don't have great options, but they are what they are. And you just have to make the best available decision. The other issue is with, you know, knowing where you're at in the market cycle. So just studying the deal and knowing the deal or even knowing the market is a level of uh, understanding. But, you know, we spend a lot of time on this show talking about what's going on in the big C the big ocean of the economic activity that all of our investing floats in. And when you begin to understand the ebb and flow of the tides and which way the wind is blowing, you know, you're better positioned to navigate if the seas get stormy. These are just things to have on your checklist as you're going through and you're thinking about uh, going forward. It's being aware of risk. You can't mitigate uh, a risk that you don't see or understand. Uh, one thing I wanted to mention, uh, you know, Bob talked about being so enamored of a deal and go charging off. You know, I'd, I'd kind of put that in the category of greed, but it's not necessarily greed. It could just be love. It just could be excitement and enthusiasm. But, but there's another thing, and this is probably one of the biggest dangers, and this is humility. Are you able to ask for help? Be honest with yourself. Are you the type of person when you're facing a difficult problem, do you ask for help? Because if you're not prone to ask for help when you're facing a big problem, you and your pride are a risk. And, and you need to be aware of it because uh, I've certainly been there. I've been there where I'm so embarrassed. I made a mistake. It's a mistake I should have never made. I should have known better. Shoulda, shoulda, shoulda. And you know, you know what, what that's all Pretty about. Pretty soon you should all over yourself. Yeah, exactly. So it's embarrassing and I don't want to have to go show everybody, you know, that I didn't do what I should have done, what I should have known. But the reality is I've learned uh, the hard way that when you have a problem, you just need to say, I need help. You need to go seek somebody qualified to help. You need to listen really seek to understand. You don't always have to do what people say. Sometimes you really are going to have the right answer yourself, but you do have to have the willingness to ask for help. And so that's another big way to mitigate risk in anything that you do is the willingness to ask for help when you need it. Don't be afraid of risk. Embrace risk. It's just like change. Don't be afraid of change. Embrace change and great things can happen. Of course, there's a lot of tools you can use and support you can get when it comes to understanding and mitigating risk, but be smart about it. That's our lesson for today. Hey, there's still time for you to get in on the 15th Annual Investors Summit at Sea. We've got an amazing faculty. We're going to stop in beautiful parts of the world and hang out with awesome folks. It's like no seminar or conference you've ever been to. It's more fun, more intense, and you will learn more and come away with real relationships like crazy. You're going to love it. You can get all the details on our website at realestateguysradio.com. Click the button that says Investors Summit at Sea. Hey, next week, we'll catch up with our good friend, Robert Kiyosaki, and find out what he has planned for the 20th anniversary of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. That's going to be fun. Thanks for risking an hour to listen to today's show. And until next week, go out and make some equity happen. This episode of the Real Estate Guys Radio Show is brought to you by Paradigm Life. Powerful cash management strategies using life insurance. Learn more at BeYourBank.com. Mid-South Home Buyers, low-cost, turnkey cash flow properties in Memphis, Tennessee. Corporate Direct, asset protection strategies for real estate investors from attorney and rich dad advisor Garrett Sutton. Find these and other great companies under the Resources tab at realestateguysradio.com. To learn how you can expose your product or service to the Real Estate Guys audience, call 888-489-7723, extension 4. That's 888 888- 
489-7723, extension 4, or use the feedback page at realestateguysradio.com. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next week right here on the Real Estate Guys Radio Show.